Okay, I'm back, and it's time to talk about operant conditioning. Um, so here's a nice little depiction of the process of operant conditioning. So here we have a seal who is um, exhibiting a behavior of balancing the ball on its nose, and it gets rewarded with that fish. And so that's the consequence of its behavior is it gets a fish. Because he is doing the ball balancing again, I know that that fish for him is a reward because it causes that behavior to occur again. If he didn't like fish and he refused to put the ball on his nose, I'd know he had been punished. But instead, he got rewarded, and so he's, he's balancing the ball again. Um, operant conditioning is all about how we can associate the consequences of our behavior with the behavior that we've already emitted, and that informs the behavior that we are um, considering displaying in the future. Okay, so the first thing to understand about operant conditioning is Thorndike's law of effect. This is a cage that he built. Um, he called it a puzzle box that he would put cats into. And like, I don't know, he did so many trials per cat. I don't know how he ever got the cat back in after the first one. You know, if you've ever put a cat in a box, they don't really like it. Um, but so he would put the cat in a box and if the cat pushed on this one little spot in the box, it would trigger the, the door to open and the cat could get out, which is presumably rewarding, right? Um, so here we have the um, time required to escape on the y-axis. And then we have the, you know, the trials that the cat experienced. He, he managed to step that cat back into the box you know, 30 times. And what you see is it's taking him less and less time to escape from the box on each trial. There are certain trials where he backslides and it actually takes him a little bit longer than the previous trial. Um, presumably he's trying some other behavior out and then remembering which one was the key. But overall, on average, he gets faster and faster as he's um, attempting to get out of the puzzle box, right? What Thorndike concluded is that, um, I've got this sort of inverted in my diagram here. Behaviors followed by favorable consequences become more likely and behaviors that are followed by unfavorable consequences become less likely. So if, uh, if the cat does a behavior that releases the door, it's more likely he'll do that same behavior next time he's in the box. Um, if he does a behavior that was unsuccessful, he may eliminate that out of his routine. Now, some of the reasons why they backslide and take a little bit longer is because um, they have to kind of try out sometimes sequences of behaviors because they're not sure which behavior was the key one. Um, so they'll try out sequences, and sometimes that takes a little bit of time, and they're the wrong sequence and stuff. So learning isn't perfect linear, but it, um, ultimately what Thorndike concluded is that the cats started focusing in on the successful behaviors, the behaviors that rewarded them by letting them out of the crate, and started eliminating the behaviors that kept them trapped. Now, the guy who's the most famous for operant conditioning is B.F. Skinner. And he is the one who really moved the idea of the law of effect forward um, by talking about um, you know, rewarding desirable behaviors, punishing undesirable behaviors in a way of shaping a learner into desirable behaviors. So here we have our press, will press lever for food because um, um, Skinner developed a Skinner box where he could place a rat or he could place a pigeon or he even made a big one and put his own daughter in it, but not for long, his wife didn't care for that. Um, but the idea was there's a lever in there and if you give the rat time to explore or the pigeon, it, they had a little area that they could peck. Um, if you give them time to explore, they'll ultimately stumble over pushing the lever or pecking the panel and a food treat comes out. And it doesn't take the learner long before they start figuring out that lever caused the food treat to come out or that pecking caused the food treat, treat, uh, treat to come out. And they'll spend their time just doing that behavior. They focus in on the behavior that led to the positive consequence. So what we're talking about there is reinforcers. Reinforcers are any outcome that strengthens the behavior that they follow. Any outcome that strengthens the behavior is considered a reinforcement. There are positive reinforcers that's where we add a desirable outcome. So if you're a meerkat, you might find it very rewarding to stand in front of the heat lamp. And so anytime you do the behavior I want, I give you access to the heat lamp. 
And so you may be more likely to do that behavior because you want to get in front of the heat lamp. If you're a child, I might let you pick out a piece of candy if you do the behavior that I want. Um, so I'm adding something that the learner wants, and that makes it more likely that they'll do the behavior again. Um, I actually have this video from um, the Big Bang Theory. They did a whole episode where they were trying to, well, Sheldon was trying to condition Penny's behavior, and so he was using positive reinforcement to do it. Um, negative reinforcement is where you remove an undesirable condition. So a lot of times people use this term wrong. They say negative reinforcement when they mean punishment. Negative means taking away. Reinforcement, reinforcement means encouraging the desirable behavior. So that's clearly not punishment. We're not taking away something in order to strengthen it when we're punishing someone, right? We're reinforcing their behavior with negative reinforcement. So we take away something that the learner doesn't like. So think about it like this. This is how Skinner meant it. Think of the positive reinforcement like a plus sign. We're going to be adding something desirable, right? In negative reinforcement, we're going to take away, we're going to subtract something that the learner doesn't like. So if you've ever taken a headache remedy when you've had a headache, you're more likely to take it again if it has actually taken away your headache, right? You're reinforced for that behavior by the removal of the headache. Now, maybe you don't take headache remedies like Tylenol. Maybe you take a headache remedy like drinking a caffeinated beverage or eating some food or drinking some water or taking a nap or other things that you've tried in the past that have helped to take away your headache. If it's taken away your headache in the past, you're more likely to try it again now because it negatively reinforced your behavior. So it takes away an undesirable condition. Using sunscreen is a good example of that. If you've ever had a bad sunburn, you're probably more likely to wear your sunscreen than if you've never had a bad sunburn. It feels like you kind of have to get that one bad sunburn to realize, I kind of like preventing a bad sunburn. I've had sunburns that have just like blistered and oh, just I've had some horrible ones. And boy, am I the sunscreen gal now because I want to avoid that undesirable outcome. So as long as I wear sunscreen, I have since I've been reliably wearing sunscreen, I've not had a blistering sunburn. Um, so it has taken away an undesirable condition and it makes it more likely that I'll do that behavior in the future, putting on sunscreen. Um, so just think about it like that. I'm adding something that the learner likes when I'm positively reinforcing. I'm taking away something that the learner doesn't like when I'm negatively reinforcing. Um, and then I have this little clip because Sheldon says, if you'd let me use negative reinforcement, I could get rid of her behavior faster. And he really means punishment. So a lot of people use it incorrectly. Okay, so here we have a nice toddler having a meltdown. Okay, now, if you've ever been a parent and given in or you've ever observed a parent giving in in the face of a child having a temper tantrum, um, you might have thought, why? Why would I give in or why did that person give in to that behavior? Well, let's think about it through reinforcements. For the child, having this temper tantrum might lead to positive reinforcement. I act like this and I get what I want. Right, So you can see the positive reinforcement for the child. And I mean, let's be honest, children don't really have much shame or embarrassment about acting like this in front of people. So what do they care about that? All they're thinking is, I might get what I want. I might literally be positively reinforced for this behavior. What's in it for the parent to give in? We all know, you know, don't give in, don't give in. But it's negative reinforcement to give in. It's negatively reinforcing to give in. I can make this undesirable condition go away if I'll just give my screaming toddler what my screaming toddler wants, right? So I'm being, I'm embarrassed right now because my toddler's acting like this. Or I can't stand that my toddler feels like this. They're so overwhelmed and they're so upset. So I want to do whatever it'll take to make them stop feeling like that. And then I'll feel better. And so I get reinforced by taking away this feeling of empathetic punishment that I'm getting from watching my child, you know, melt down. Um, so parents are able to get rid of something they don't like by giving in, and toddlers are able to get something that they want 
by having this tantrum. And so you can kind of see how the cycle might continue. Thing that parents need to remember is that while this might get rid of the ten temper tantrum right now, you may be just fueling future temper tan tantrums because you're positively reinforcing this behavior. And you have to sort of decide before they ever even happen. I am not going to give in, and you can't ever give in because um, children, learners, it only takes one reinforcement, and then they start working for it, and they'll stick to it for a while. So um, let's talk a little bit about how reinforcement actually works. Um, one thing that we can do when we're trying to teach our learner what we want is we can reinforce them for behaviors that are close to what we want. We call those successive approximations. Um, another term for it is shaping. So we reward the behavior as it comes closer and closer to the desired behavior, as it successfully, successively approximates the actual behavior that we want. So if you want your dog to run agility courses, um, one of the big stumbling blocks for dogs is running through the tunnel. They're like, whoa, like some dogs like it. There are certain breeds that like it. But especially a dog like this one um, probably really didn't want to go into the tunnel the first time. So what you do is you shape them through successive approximations to being willing to go through the tunnel. So you see that those tunnels collapse. So you can collapse it down until it's actually just a little ring, really. And you use treats, right, reinforce the animal for just going through the ring. And then maybe you spread it out until it's just one, one width, um, that they have to go through, then maybe two widths. And you keep bringing it closer and closer, a little longer, a little longer each time. If they start to balk, you bring them back again. And then you, and, but you don't reinforce them for the smaller one, you just get them to come through it. The reinforcement comes when you, when you go a step further. And so we keep reinforcing you farther and farther, closer and closer, until now I can run through a 10 foot tunnel that I never would have gone through initially. I needed to go in those steps right, to get over my fear or my, you know, uncertainty or whatever. So I needed to go in those little steps. Sometimes you need to go in those little steps because the learner literally doesn't know what you want. I mean, imagine if you were training Shamu back in the day, you know, when they were trying to teach a killer whale to do flips. I mean, killer whales come out of the water, they breach, they do things that they don't normally flip, but you can train an animal to do really elaborate behaviors by training them by rewarding them for coming out of the water okay now that i've got now that i've um taught you that what i want is you out of the water i'm going to raise the stakes and now you actually have to get your whole abdomen out of the water um, before you get the reward and like that and so we we train through these successive approximations some pretty complex behaviors once the behavior is, is learned, then usually with an animal like Shamu or a dog who's performing like this, we'd want to reward after every single time they display the desirable behavior so they don't backslide. Um, we'll get to a um, discussion of um, how you should reward in a second. What you should reward is a good question. Um, primary reinforcers are reinforcers that b meet basic needs. There are things that are intrinsically desirable, um, just like we talked about unconditioned stimuli in classical conditioning. You could kind of think of these as unconditioned stimuli, things that you don't have to learn to want. Um, so food, sex, fun, power, attention, those kinds of things are good examples of primary reinfor reinforcers because they are just inherently um, reinforcing. You want them, you like them, you don't have to be taught anything about it. Secondary reinforcers are ones that are conditioned, right? So we oftentimes call them conditioned reinforcers. And um, they are only rewarding because the learner has figured out that the conditioned reinforcer is associated with the primary reinforcer in some way. Um, so for example, the reason why we're willing to work for money is because it's a secondary reinforcer that allows us to buy pretty much all the primary reinforcers, right? Um, so we'll work for that money because it gets us the things that we naturally want. So we've all learned to want money because, you know, as a reward, because we know it'll get us whatever we want. Um, so secondary reinforcers are only reinforcing because of their association with the primary reinforcers. Um, so it, we're going to talk about how we could reward children with um, a star chart when we get to, um, you know, later in class. 
Um, you know, you could put stars on the chart for every desirable behavior, and at the end they can earn some. They can use those stars to buy something else or to um, earn the the big prize if they have enough stars at the end of the week or something. Um, those stars are secondary reinforcers, and they are only valuable because they allow the the learner to get the primary reinforcers with it. So what we give, we can give a primary or we can give a secondary. When we give, we can give the re reinforcer immediately or we can give it sometime later. A lot of animals, maybe with the exception of the other primates, maybe elephants, um, you have to do immediate reinforcement if you're going to train your learner. Uh, this puppy and this little girl out for a walk, if you don't have your treats ready for that puppy, any desirable behaviors that are emitted on that walk, the puppy's going to have forgotten it. By the time you get home, you go, wow, you were such a good puppy. Let me give you a nice, you know, chew toy as a reward. The puppy's like, I, I like the chew toy, but I have no clue what you're rewarding me for. Whereas the little girl, even though she's little, you can say to her, wow, you sure handled the puppy really well today. When we get home, you know, I'm going to let you pick out, um, you know, your favorite treat or your favorite show to watch or something, right? Because children and us humans, maybe the primates and elephants, we can learn from delayed reinforcement. So we can promise her a reward that will come at some point in the future. Um, we could get home and say, you know what? You were so good on that walk. Here's your reinforcement. And they didn't even know that it was coming, but they know what you mean by thank you for being good on the walk or whatever. We're such good delayed reinforcement receivers that we can <laughs> look at this. We have a check that represents money, which is a secondary reinforcer, right? So we can take a delayed reinforcement. You got to go cash that check or at least take a picture of it, load it in your bank, wait for it to clear. And then now we have some secondary reinforcers that now we can use to buy some primary reinforcement. I mean, we're really good at delayed re reinforcement. And there's a lot of evidence that being able to delay gratification helps us to set up long-term goals and strive towards, you know, longer-term things. And so one of the things that humans can do that other animals can't is sort of plan for the future, right? Now, I know that, you know, a squirrel puts away nuts and stuff like that, but I don't think they're thinking about it quite like, I think they eat their fill now and then put the extras away as opposed to we could say to ourselves, we better not eat it all because we've been shipwrecked and who knows how long we're going to be here. We better ration it, stuff like that. We can say stuff like that that, you know, a squirrel wouldn't do. Um, and so that's what I'm talking about as far as this delaying gratification issue. If you've never watched the marshmallow test, it's a pretty funny one on YouTube. Um, now, so we've decided we could give either, either primary or secondary reinforcers. We've realized we can either give them immediately or we can give them on a delay if we have, you know, humans that we're dealing with. Now, how often should we reinforce behaviors? I picked this nice um, pigeon because Skinner worked with pigeons quite frequently. But if you're talking about training your dog or your child or something, how often should we reinforce? Well, with an animal, you probably should use conditioned re continu continuous reinforcement as much as you possibly can because it makes sure that the learner figures out what the desired behavior is um, really quickly so that you're not really frustrated with each other as you're trying to figure out what behavior are you striving for, training person. Um, so with continuous reinforcement, every time the learner does the behavior, you reward it. It's really important when you're teaching a new behavior. If you're trying to teach your dog to sit, every single time that dog's hiney hits the floor, you give the reinforcement. So you say sit. Even if they accidentally put their butt down, you go, good dog, give them their reinforcement every time. So that they'll make the association between sit and butt on the floor. Um, because what you want is them figure, you need their light bulb to go on so they can figure out what behavior you want. Now, once you've started the continuous reinforcement and they've figured out what you want, it makes a lot of sense to switch over to a partial, partial reinforcement schedule, where sometimes you reinforce the behavior and sometimes you don't. It's often referred to as an intermittent reinforcement schedule because, again, sometimes reinforced and sometimes not. Now, if you start from the get-go with this, um, if you start from the very beginning when the learner doesn't know what you want, um, the 
partial reinforcement schedule is going to take a long time for the learner to figure out what you want. Um, so it takes them longer from the beginning. So we recommend that you start with continuous so that they'll learn the behavior quickly. Um, but once you've taught the behavior, if you switch over to partial reinforcement, the behavior will stick around a lot longer. So if it's a behavior that you want to continue, partial reinforcement allows a longer time between rewards and the learner's a lot more, um, uh, the learning is much more robust. Okay, so there are different kinds of partial reinforcement schedules that you can do. There are those that are based on an interval of time, and then there are those that are based on a ratio of the instances of behavior to the reward that you're going to give. So let me describe. So based on interval of time, I'm going to, on a fixed interval schedule, reinforce you every so often. So for example, most of us who um, work for pay um, get paid once a week or once every two weeks, something like that. The variable interval schedule, you get reinforced unpredictably often. So those of us who work for tips, for example, you get rewarded. You don't know how much time is going to elapse between rewards, right? Um, I used to be a waitress. And, you know, I, you expect a tip at the end of every um, guest meal. That's not always happened, unfortunately. Um, but who knows how long that guest meal is going to take? Some of my customers would come in by themselves, eat their food in 15 minutes, and be out of here. Others would come in with a group, and they'd be there an hour and a half, and I'm like, how much time is going to elapse before I get my reinforcement, uh, right? So you can kind of imagine pay. It could be fixed interval. It could be variable interval, depending on how you're being paid. Um, ratio, you get – on a fixed ratio schedule, you get reinforced for every so many behaviors. So uh, a fixed ratio schedule, um, you get, for example, um, reinforced for every 50 widgets that you make. You get paid your commission or whatever. Um, so every so many completed widgets, you get paid. The variable ratio schedule, you get paid sometimes after five widgets and sometimes you get paid after 30 widgets. You have no idea when you're going to get reinforced for, the, for that behavior. It happens whenever. Um, so let's see how this works in real life. Your choices are ratio or interval. So remember, ratio is the number of behaviors admitted. Interval is how much time has passed. And then fixed means it's always going to be predictable. Variable means it's always going to be unpredictable. Getting paid weekly, no matter how much work is done, that's going to be fixed interval. You get paid after a week no matter what. Hitting a jackpot after some handle pulls on the slot machine, that's going to be variable ratio. You have to pull and pull and pull and pull. I'm not talking about the modern casino, by the way, where you get to stick this card in, push a button, it just runs itself out. I'm talking about literally you put a coin in, you pull. You put a coin in, you pull. Sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't. You have no idea how many times you're going to have to put a coin in and pull before you actually get reinforced. Winning some days on the lottery that you play once a day. So every 24 hours you buy a ticket and sometimes you get reinforced and sometimes you don't. I was trying to emphasize the, the interval that, you know, you play it every day, and some of those days you get reinforced and some not. My students have made an argument that it could be variable ratio because the act is buying the ticket, so you may have to buy some number of tickets before you get reinforced, and that kind of makes sense also. Um, it's not perfect um, when we're trying to discriminate between ratio and interval. It's not perfect. Um, Hopefully, it's getting you thinking. Checking your cell phone repeatedly, sometimes you find that you have gotten a text. I'm thinking that that's a variable ratio schedule because you keep checking, keep checking, keep checking. Sometimes you've gotten rewarded. So that was my labeling on it. Buy eight pizzas, get the next one free. Fixed ratio. You know exactly how many behaviors you have to emit before you get the reward. So fixed ratio. Which one works better? 
assuming that they all started off knowing what the desired behavior is, right? You've got your learner to the point where they know what, they, what you want from them. Here's an example where we've got rats that are trained up pushing a lever. So they've been continuously reinforced to find out that the lever is meaningful. And now they've been switched to some kind of partial reinforcement schedule. So on the, on the y-axis, you see the number of lever pushes um, that are occurring. And then in, along the x-axis, you see how much time is elapsing. The little black marks on each of the colored lines refers to when they receive a reinforcement. So on the far left, we see fixed ratio, and then the next one over is the variable ratio schedule. And you see that what you get in both of those is a lot of consistent lever pushing. They're pushing it frequently. They're pushing it fast, right? They're getting a 1,000 lever pushes in in just over 10 minutes. That's a lot of lever pushing. Um, so they're, going, they're fast. They're consistent. You see that they're persistent. Notice on the variable ratio, so the first couple of rewards came very quickly, one right after the next. And then um, there's this big delay between the, the second reinforcement and the third reinforcement. The nice thing about the variable ratio is you'll see, you see them being very consistent across that time. They're still pushing it really hard because they're like, maybe this is just a dry spell. I have to keep going. The next two lines refer to intervals passing. And so you see that in the reddish one, the fixed interval schedule, the reinforcement is coming after a set amount of time. So no matter how much lever pushing is occurring, the last lever push before the interval ends is the one that gets reinforced. So you see the rats kind of just taking a break for some amount of time, and then they're suddenly displaying a flurry of lever pushing right before the interval ends so they can get their reward. Um, I see that with students when I have my exams planned out. They know when they're going to happen. So you can kind of not really read your book, not really prepare your study guide, not really think about your exam until there's this flurry of activity right before the exam, right? Um, that's one of the downsides of fixed intervals like that. The variable interval schedule would be, in humans, that would be pop quizzes. You don't know when you're going to be tested on the material. And so what, what do you see there in that variable interval, that bluish gray bar? Steady responding. So you see more lever pushing occurring in the, in the variable inter, interval. So the analogy for us humans is you would be studying more consistently across the quarter if you knew that any day was pop quiz day. I've discovered that it really doesn't affect student reading or preparation. It just makes them angry. So I don't do pop quizzes. Um, it doesn't seem to really affect the scores on the test or anything. So I, just, I don't see the point. It just it makes all of us mad. If you want the best responding, you actually have to have to reinforce on on behaviors, not on time. That's the one thing you can see here. If you want a lot of the behaviors, you have to reinforce the behaviors, not the time elapsing. All right, so we have to switch to the other side now. We've been talking about how to encourage behavior. Let's talk about punishments, which are outcomes that weaken the behavior, that discourage the behavior. Now, just like with reinforcement, there are positive and there are negative punishments. So remember, we're, with positive, we're adding something. So with a positive punishment, we're going to add an undesirable outcome, something that the learner does not want. So for example, um, in psychology, sometimes we'll shock the learner always fun, but probably kind of mean, but we'll shock the learner as a punishment. Or um, in real life, you might be assigned more chores as a punishment for, you know, something else that you've done wrong. Um, so we add something that the learner doesn't like when we do a positive punishment. In negative punishment, we're going to take away something that the learner does like, right? So we see this kind of symmetry, right, where with positive reinforcement, we're adding a desirable outcome, positive punishment. We're, we're adding an undesirable outcome. Negative reinforcement, we're taking away something that the learner doesn't like, and that's rewarding. In negative punishment, we're going to remove something that the learner does like, and that's punishing, right? I want that, and you're taking it away. So for example, maybe we'll take you away from everybody else. You have to go sit in the corner having a timeout because we don't like your behavior. Or my personal favorite, when my son was younger, um, take away his oh, he'd be mad at me because I didn't even care what console player this was. I never knew what exactly he had. I think he had a PlayStation. I don't know. I'd take it away all the time when he was younger. And I even said to him, you've given me too much power with your obsession with this machine. Like, get control over yourself 
and it won't be powerful enough for me to take away. <laughs> this is a perfect punishment. He hated losing it. So then he would change his behavior, right? He would stop doing whatever it was that caused me to take it away from him. Um, sometimes people misunderstand punishments. They say, I've had parents say, um, I've tried time out. I've tried taking away my child's coveted item and it doesn't work. Um, and I ask them how they've implemented the idea. And a lot of times what I get from them is basically that they uh, take a small child, a five-year-old, and send them to their room for half an hour. That's not how you do a time out. Notice that this child sitting out in the public space being ignored by everybody else who's in the public space. Punishments are um, supposed to be, in that case, taking away something that you want. You have to remember what you want. When you're five years old and you're sitting in your room for 30 minutes, there's no learning occurring there. A five-year-old should not spend more than five minutes in time out, and they shouldn't be by themselves in their room. Um, taking away the Xbox, I had a, a student tell me that she took her, her son's Xbox away for a month. That's a little excessive, and it, it loses its point. Um, one of the most important things that you can do when you're using negative reinforcement, like either one of these, is give the learner an opportunity to get back the thing that they've had taken away. So after the timeout, the child should be welcomed back into the group. The timeout's over. Tell me you're sorry for what you did. Let's have hugs and kisses, and let's get back to what we were doing, right? Let's get reintegrated into the group that you were sad to leave. Um, when it's when the time is up with your Xbox prohibition, you need to get it back. You need to be able to earn it back. Um, so a month and just an arbitrary length doesn't really make a lot of sense. The learner has to realize that their changed behavior is what will get their um, you know, removed item back. Um, now, there is an association between positive punishment and negative reinforcement. There's like... You've already got a history where if you do a misdeed, something I didn't want, I'm going to punish you with, let's say, washing the dishes. Now I can use that as a negative reinforcer to say, if you do what I want, you won't have to wash the dishes. Right? You can avoid the punishment if you do what I want. So you have like this trade-off between positive punishment and negative reinforcement. Um, you have a trade-off between negative punishment and positive reinforcement, right? I'll, I will give you the opportunity to play Xbox. I will take away the ability to play Xbox. Um, so these things are not like isolated and it is easy to get them confused. Um, but if you mean that you want the behavior to be reduced, just make sure you use the word punishment in your term. If you want the behavior to increase, use the word reinforcement and then you'll always be right. Um, here's an example. This actually is a pretty funny one because it illustrates. So what happens in this clip is they have been off topic and they're not getting their work done. So they all agree to put duct tape on their arm. And if they start, if they ta start talking about something that takes the group off track, um, the other group member gets to rip off their duct tape and that's going to cause pain. So that's punishment, right? Um, so of course, Sheldon immediately takes them off track. And so Leonard rips off his duct tape. And Sheldon gets mad because his duct tape got ripped off. He thought that his question was legitimate and everybody else agreed that it wasn't and so now he's mad. That's what oftentimes happens with punishment is that when punishment is doled, doled out, it actually backfires oftentimes. So when is it effective? Um, for one thing, Skinner was really clear. Our emphasis should be on reinforcements, not on punishments. He said, when punishment is removed, it should be very, is used, it should be very sparing. So he thought 10 reinforcements for every one punishment was like the most frequent you should even think about having punishments. It's usually inverted in most households. A lot of times parents are like, Ugh, I'm sick of telling you this all the time. That's it. I'm punishing you. And a lot of times parents won't even tune in until they until there's a punishable offense. As long as the children are being good, they just don't say anything. And then as soon as there's a punishable offense, then they come in and they say something. Um, Skinner says it should be the other way, that we should spend our time um, shaping desirable behavior. He says reinforcement is much more effective in shaping behavior than punishment is. 
A lot of times when punishment fails, parents think, well, I guess I just need to do it harder. No. You need to step back and think, okay, how can I get them to be engaged in the desired behavior and not focus in on the times when they trip and do an undesirable behavior? I need to focus on shaping the desirable behaviors. Um, punishment is much less informative than reinforcement is. If you've ever played the hot and cold game where something is hidden and then everybody else in the group is going, you know, cold, cold, freezing, warm, warmer, warm, you're burning up. The warm, warmer, burning up is much more informative than the cold, cold, freezing. You're walking around aimlessly and they just keep telling you you're wrong. But as soon as you start homing in and somebody goes warmer and then everybody else, interestingly, will start piling on too and then everybody's like warmer, warmer, hot, hot, oh, boiling – you start beelining, as soon as you start getting that feedback that is encouraging your behavior, you can really hone your behavior into exactly what's needed. When people are just telling you no, wrong, 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 it, it makes you feel hopeless. There's not much um, information there. And so what you end up with is a learner who feels like either you're a big scary person and you're just gonna dole out punishments and I'm scared of you, so fear, or a feeling of helplessness. Nothing I do is leading to any kinds of reinforcement. Everything I do is leading to punishment, it feels like. And even though the person who's doling out the punishment feels like, oh, most of the time everything's fine and every once in a while I have to punish, the fact that they're quiet during the times everything's going fine feels to the learner as if the learner is never getting any positive feedback and all they ever get is negative. It could cause retaliation. That's what happened with Sheldon. When Leonard ripped off his um, duct tape, he immediately ripped one off of Leonard. And Leonard hadn't done anything wrong, but Sheldon felt entitled to retaliate. That oftentimes happens with learners. Um, you think you're doling out a punishment, and they feel like this is personal, and you're picking on me. So retaliation is a problem. Increased negative behavior when alone. A lot of times, the punishment can only be doled out as long as the punisher is available, right? So mom and dad are at work. I'm going to play Xbox as much as I want. You're not here to control me anyway, right? So increased negative behavior when alone. I get all of it out of my system. You come home, I look like a perfect little angel. I've just been sitting here, you know, doing my homework. Of course, if you felt my Xbox, you'd feel that it's really hot and I've been playing it for the past three hours. But as far as you can tell, I'm, I'm completely embedded in my homework and I'm a perfect little angel. So I avoid punishment, but I still get my behaviors out. I still get to do what I want to do. Um, so a lot of times with punishment, we aren't guiding um, our learners towards the actual desirable behavior. We're just teaching them ways to get what they want without having to actually do the desirable behaviors. Now, there are criticisms of operant conditioning, just like there were of cl classical conditioning. Um, for one thing, just like classical conditioning, um, Skinner discounted evidence of cognition. Now, obviously, he knew he had thoughts inside of his head, but what he meant by this is that when we're trying to explain behavior, it is not helpful to attribute thoughts as motivations for the behavior. We shouldn't be, be saying things like the learner wants a reward or things like that because we don't know what's going on inside the learner's head. So we should say things like uh, this behavior was rewarded. The next time the learner was given an opportunity, they displayed the behavior again. That outcome must have been rewarding. It, everything has to be out and visible to be meaningful for him. The problem with that is that there are ways that we can elicit evidence that learners have acquired knowledge, learning, um, without any rewards having happened. Like you carry around inside of your head cognitive maps of places that you've been without having been rewarded for the formation of those maps at all. Um, they found with rats that um, if you turned a, a rat loose, do I have the little maze picture? Um, yeah, if you turn the rat loose just to wander around in the, in the uh, maze, they will form a map of the maze. And we know that through uh, measures of what we call latent learning. Learning that happens um, without any reinforcement and that only becomes apparent when the reinforcement is provided. So in this chart that you're seeing here, we have the number of errors that the rat made across the x-axis is the number of trials. 
the green rat is a rat who is placed into the maze and never in encounters any kind of reinforcement. It's just wandering around, sometimes walks out of the maze and sometimes doesn't, just sort of wanders around making a lot of mistakes. The blue line is a rat that is reinforced every single time that they're in the maze. So there's always cheese at the end of the maze. And we see that the rat learns pretty quickly the route through the, map, the maze so that they can get to the cheese. So you see that blue line being a, um, you know, very, a lot fewer errors by the end than we see in the green line. But what's really interesting for this conversation is the red line, because we have a rat who at the beginning is not reinforced for their behaviors in the maze. They're just like the green line rat. They're just put in there and they're wandering around. But starting on day 11, the rat starts getting reinforced for making it successfully through the, the maze. And very quickly, you notice how sharply the line drops off. It goes drops down to really good um, performance, even below the number of errors that the always reinforced rats are making. So that's evidence that while they were wandering around and just exploring the maze, the rats were forming a cognitive map of the maze. And it didn't become apparent until they started being reinforced for it. Um, so that shows the rats are thinking something Obviously, um, Skinner didn't think it was important to talk about these things because he thought that it just muddied the waters of understanding. But I think this kind of research suggests that it is worthwhile to talk about, you know, cognition. So, um, all right. Our final segment will be learning by observation.